Hi everybody, I'm Skip Alzheimer. Welcome to the AV Geeks Lunchtime Streaming Show, where we watch old 16mm films, and uh, you in the comments correct mistakes that I've made. Uh, today, I forgot to mute the uh, Mother Duck and the Big Race uh, soundtrack, which was actually just a bunch of perf holes running over a sound head, making a brrrr sound. Uh, and also, the date wasn't changed, so thank you guys for that. Uh, I believe in the comments on YouTube, uh, old radios uh, wondered if Cornet used European animation. They indeed do did. Um, and we know this because we sometimes see credits that credit the original animation studios, uh, sometimes in the Czech Republic or Hungary. Uh, also Japan. Uh, I think the company was Gakken. Um, and we found... In scanning a bunch of the materials for Coronet, we found some of the original uh, Japanese or European um, films that were repurposed. Uh, they just had different titles. Uh, this one didn't have a soundtrack, and we hope to find a soundtrack for it because it's just sweet. It's just sweet. Okay, so um, like I said, watch old 16 millimeter films. Uh, this one is about simple uh, machines pulleys you learn about all the simple machines do you remember what they all are write them in the comments uh, i will say that one of them is an inclined plane so simple machines enjoy <laughs> If you've ever tried to raise someone up into a tree, you know how much force it takes to raise this much weight by pulling up. But these two painters raise their own weight and the heavy scaffold too. And the work doesn't look as hard. With a simple machine, the pulley, the work can be easier. Let's see why. Here's one reason. This is a single fixed pulley. It's fastened to a support. How much force will it take to lift a 20 pound weight? 20 pounds. This kind of pulley does not increase force, but it's easier to pull down than up because we pull with the weight of our body. So, Fixed pulleys can help by changing the direction of a force. But the pulley on the scaffold, moving with the weight, can help by increasing the force. Now, with a movable pulley, let's see how much force it takes to lift the 20 pound weight. Only about 10 pounds. And because the pulleys can all turn freely, the force in each rope is about the same. See? 10 pounds in this rope. And 10 pounds in this rope. Together, they lift 20 pounds. But how far does the force move to lift that weight? With this pulley machine, the weight is lifted one foot, while the force moves two feet. So we trade distance for force. We move the force farther to lift the weight. To gain more force, we can add more pulleys. Now we have two fixed pulleys and two movable pulleys. There are four ropes supporting the weight. How much force will it take to lift the weight? About five pounds. In each rope, about five pounds. Four ropes support 20 pounds. And the force must move four times as far as the weight, trading distance for force. But there are five ropes. Why isn't the force multiplied by five? Notice only four ropes support the weight. 
The fifth rope just changes the direction of the force. We pull down to move the weight up. Of course, there could be five supporting ropes if we fastened one end to the movable block and pulley. Five ropes lifting, so the force required here to lift 20 pounds is about four pounds. But it has to move five times as far as the weight. Now we've shown the pulleys hanging separately. But sometimes you see two pulleys together. Or three. The frame and the pulleys in it are called a pulley block. And the whole pulley system is called a block and tackle. Here again, with five supporting ropes, you can lift a weight of 20 pounds with a force of four pounds. So we can rig pulleys to help us in two ways. Fixed pulleys change the direction of our force, lifting when we pull down. Sometimes fixed pulleys help us lift when we pull sideways. Sometimes fixed pulleys balance one weight against another, so we can lift loads easier. Movable pulleys help us in another way, multiplying force. Movable pulleys trade distance for force, so we can lift heavy loads making our work easier with simple machines. Um, and so what were the other ones? Inclined plane, fulcrum. Um, the screw is basically an inclined plane that's wrapped around a cylinder. Uh, I can't remember what were the other ones, um, and I'm I'm saving you a, a little bit. There's another coronet series that talks about simple machines, and it features a cat, and it's a different cat. No, it's not a cat. It's a frog, I think, or a lizard. It's a lizard. That's what it is. Uh, I don't know if I've shown them yet, but I'll be interested to see if. Um, the lizard gets the same response that Wonder Cat gets. Oh, and we found some more Wonder Cat films too, so these might show up at some point. Uh, if it's somebody's birthday, maybe. Uh, all right, so behind me we have a film scanner, and uh, my assistant, uh, or my intern, Mari, actually uh, built up the reel. She has been going through, trying to find films that have not been scanned, uh, and scanning them. So. This is her first attempt at this, and so this is, we're going to start off with air pollution and plant life, brought to us by the United States government. Enjoy. The byproducts of man's industrial development have created one of the most serious problems facing civilization. Every day, a variety of chemical agents are released into the atmosphere. Chemical agents that create serious problems for human life, animals, property, and plant life. The pollutants you can see, although obnoxious and offensive to the nose and sight, are not as dangerous to plant life as the invisible gases coming out of the stacks at the same time. The gray-colored fly ash you see deposited on these leaves comes from a coal-burning power plant. 
visible pollutants such as fly ash and other particulates detract from the appearance of the plant and reduce the amount of light absorbed by the leaves. The fly ash was rubbed from pine needles on the left. The invisible gases emitted into the atmosphere are much more dangerous than visible particulates to most species of plant life. Without controls, chemical agents attack plant life in ways that can reduce growth and result in yield loss, produce a damaging appearance, and ultimately threaten the very existence of vegetation. This film will acquaint you with some of the major pollutants and show you examples of vegetation injury caused by each. The amount of air pollution injury to vegetation varies with the concentration of pollutants in the air and the amount of time plant life is exposed. If vegetation is exposed to a high level of pollutant over a short period of time, it may suffer acute injury. Exposure to lower levels over a long period can cause chronic injury. Various plant species differ in susceptibility to air pollution injury. This mixed stand several miles from a source of pollution shows the difference in susceptibility among species. Susceptibility also may differ within a particular species. Here, a stand of Virginia pine exposed to sulfur dioxide from a coal burning source contains trees that show little or no injury to those with severe injury, stunting an extensive needle burn. This tree shows little signs of injury. This one shows signs of being moderately susceptible. And this one shows signs of severe susceptibility. This stand of loblolly pine, also exposed to sulfur dioxide, again shows the difference in susceptibility within the species to injury from air pollution. Tip burn like this results from tissue death and causes reduction in photosynthesis and food production, limiting future growth. Injury can occur at great distances from a source of pollution. Acute injury due to sulfur dioxide exposure occurred to a number of plant species more than five miles from the source. Black oak, white ash, hickory, dwarf sumac, blackberry, farkleberry, and blackjack oak. One of the earliest agents associated with pollution, sulfur dioxide, is created by the combustion of fossil fuels. Field crops and other plant life are also susceptible to sulfur dioxide. The light tan necrosis is typical of sulfur dioxide injury on corn. The injury you see occurred five and one half miles from a plant spewing invisible quantities of sulfur dioxide. Corn is affected in varying degrees in the same field. The necrotic streaking on the lower leaves of corn in the area may also be due to sulfur dioxide. Additional research is needed to substantiate the cause of this condition. Potato plants in the same area display white and tan leaf necrosis. The holes were created when dead tissue fell away. Many native weed species are also injured by sulfur dioxide. Therefore, sensitive species can be used as indicators of toxic levels of sulfur dioxide. Smartweed, common in many areas of the United States, shows varying degrees of leaf necrosis when exposed. Here, giant ragweed also shows typical sulfur dioxide injury from exposure. Cinnamon fern shows light brown necrotic areas. Evidence of sulfur dioxide injury on Small's ragwort 
shows up as irregular brown necrotic areas. Lespedeza, often grown as a forage crop, is another indicator of sulfur dioxide emissions. Another invisible pollutant discharged into the atmosphere, uncontrolled. Small amounts of hydrogen fluoride can be harmful to vegetation. You cannot see the fluoride being discharged into the atmosphere from these stacks. What you see are particulates. The fluoride, which is harmful, is invisible. Hidden by trees in the foreground, a metal reduction plant discharges pollutants, including hydrogen fluoride, into the atmosphere. Carried on the wind, the chemical agents released affect neighboring plant life. The trees on this hillside have suffered. Many have died, probably from exposure to fluoride. When toxic levels of fluoride are absorbed by plant tissues, a variety of symptoms result. One of the classical symptoms of fluoride injury in the southeast is marginal chlorosis of citrus leaves. Notice how the yellowed tissue contrasts with the green area along the veins. Long-term exposure to elevated levels of fluoride caused this chronic injury to citrus leaves. In other areas, fluorides may also produce marginal chlorosis. Marginal chlorosis shows up here on sugar maple and rhododendron. Cottonwood near fluoride sources displays both marginal chlorosis and intervenal chlorosis. Other species show intervenal chlorosis and necrosis, such as red maple. Sassafras. Black oak. Some species, such as poison ivy, show a pigmentation change which would not be expected in midsummer. Exposed to fluoride released a quarter of a mile away, shingle oak shows a downward cupping of leaves with irregular necrotic areas. Sumac displays a marginal and intervenal necrosis. The tips of the blades of cattails were killed when continually exposed to elevated levels of fluoride. White pine needles show varying amounts of tip burn after exposure. These symptoms in your area may indicate the presence of fluoride in the air. An investigation of the possible pollutant sources and knowledge of pollutant levels is needed for a more accurate diagnosis. In the area where fluoride symptoms were present, leaf analysis revealed levels of from 100 to 300 parts per million in leaves displaying symptoms. These levels are much higher than the 5 to 15 parts per million which would be found in geographical areas away from fluoride sources. When animal forage contains 35 or more parts per million of fluoride, Cattle grazing continuously on this forage may develop skeletal deformities and may eventually die if forage levels stay above 60 parts per million. This is photochemical pollution, becoming an increasingly common phenomenon in many urban areas. Photochemical pollution begins when the products of fossil fuel combustion are released into the atmosphere. A photochemical reaction through the energy of sunlight can result in phytotoxic concentrations of photochemical oxidants. One of the most important of these is ozone. Another is called peroxyacetyl nitrate, commonly called PAN, PAN. Both can be injurious to a variety of species of plant life. This is Lake Arrowhead, California, in the San Bernardino Mountains, a resort area 75 miles east of Los Angeles. Its lakes, cool climate, and trees are its main attractions. But for how long? Property values and recreation are threatened by destruction of ponderosa pine and other coniferous species. The cause? Photochemical oxidants. Research to date indicates that ozone is the major cause of plant injury in this area, but other elements of the photochemical complex may be involved. Symptoms of oxidant injury on ponderosa pine include premature death of needles. 
The second year needles on this ponderosa pine have already died and many have dropped. The current year needles show an irregular chlorotic mottling. As with other pollutants, individual members of a species can vary in susceptibility when exposed to oxidants. The pine tree you see on the right is relatively resistant. The one on the left is susceptible. Christmas tree plantations 50 miles from an urban center are also suffering from photochemical pollution. This stand of Monterey pine shows premature death of second year needles and chlorosis and necrosis of current year needles. The stipple and early leaf senescence you see on these grape leaves was one of the first symptoms associated with the effects of photochemical oxidants on vegetation. Oxidants reduce the grape plant's ability to photosynthesize food, thereby reducing grape yields. Okra in areas where oxidants are a problem also displays stippling of the leaves. Extensive plantings of celery often are exposed to toxic levels of oxidant pollutants. Most of the lower celery leaves show symptoms of ozone injury, white intervenal necrosis. Corn growing in the same area also shows necrosis. Field observations revealed that photochemical pollution has apparently reduced corn yield by affecting pollination, thereby reducing the number of normally developed kernels. Although, as with most crops, the extent of economic loss is not yet known, growth and yield of alfalfa is reduced by photochemical oxidants, which cause premature leaf drop and these symptoms. Onions display premature tip dieback as a result of exposure to oxidant pollution. Ozone symptoms on citrus may show up as white necrotic flecking. Mallow or cheese weed indicates the presence of phytotoxic levels of photochemical oxidants. Necrotic spotting on lamb's quarters, a weed found in many areas, is a good indicator of phytotoxic levels of oxidants. The pigmentation and undersurface glazing of this prickly lettuce indicates that phytotoxic levels of pan have been present. Romaine lettuce is a vegetable very sensitive to pan. It exhibits undersurface glazing and necrotic areas. Barley exposed to photochemical oxidants displays necrosis in areas of the leaf which were susceptible during exposure. Experimental laboratory exposures indicate pan produced this symptom. In addition to farm crops, photochemical oxidants also injure plants grown in residential gardens. The petunias on the left grown in non-filtered air were injured by photochemical pollution. Those on the right were grown in filtered air and were not injured. Light-colored necrotic areas show up on exposed plants. Photochemical pollution is not limited to one geographic area. In the eastern half of the United States, one of the early reports of vegetation injury from photochemical oxidants was on tobacco leaves. When first reported, it was called weather fleck. Research revealed the injury was caused by the ozone component in photochemical pollution, which is becoming increasingly prevalent in the eastern United States, where much of our tobacco is grown. Besides affecting the quality of the tobacco, the symptoms remain after leaves are cured, making the leaves unsuitable for use as cigar wrappers. Even plants grown in an unfiltered greenhouse show injury from photochemical oxidant pollutants in our atmosphere. These petunias display an oxidant type of injury. A purplish stipple appears on these field-grown lima beans exposed to oxidant pollution. In greenhouse experiments with plants grown in filtered and unfiltered air, only those grown in unfiltered air showed symptoms of injury due to pollution. The sweet gum trees on the right, exposed to oxidants, show a marked change in leaf pigmentation. The corn leaf on the right, grown in unfiltered air, 
shows longitudinal flecking. The euphorbia plant on the right, grown in unfiltered air, is stunted and its leaves have fallen prematurely. Another form of air pollution, not widespread, but nevertheless potentially damaging, can be caused by an accidental spill of chemicals toxic to plants. These scenes resulted when a chemical tank truck accidentally overturned in June 1969, spilling anhydrous ammonia. Nearly every form of vegetation was severely injured and in some cases killed within a half mile downwind when the wind carried the ammonia over the countryside. The surviving plants may recover and produce a crop, but growth and yield will surely be reduced. In this garden, a quarter of a mile away from the spill, most of the vegetation was injured. Here's what ammonia injury looked like on tomatoes, table beets, and cabbage. Occasionally, pollutants in the atmosphere will chemically react with the moisture in the atmosphere to form new chemical compounds injurious to plant life. These spots on the black cherry leaf were thought to be the result of nitric or sulfuric acid droplets that accumulated on the leaves. The same symptom. Right, so um, the uh, film scanner was so bored with that film uh, <clears throat> that it actually stopped uh, recording <laughs> and crashed. <laughs> all right um maury i'm sorry they they didn't like it it's okay it's all right she's okay with it but yeah sorry about that oh well sometimes sometimes that happens uh in the meantime let's uh learn about thailand and uh some rice no learn about thailand land of rice enjoy Seven thousand miles across the Pacific, in the region of the world known as Southeast Asia, lies the country of Thailand, formerly known as Siam. Thailand means land of the free. Protected by high mountains, Siam kept its independence until World War II, when it was briefly occupied by Japan. The Chao Praya River forms a narrow plain on which the Thai people grow a rich harvest of rice. Near the mouth of the Chao Praya River lies Bangkok, the capital of Thailand, one of the great rice exporting harbors of the world, and the important center of spiritual and cultural life for some 20 million Thai people. Siamese kings in the last half century opened the doors of their country to the outside world. This ancient royal palace has seen many changes in the past 50 years, like the change from absolute monarchy to parliamentary government. In this parliament and in these buildings, an efficient administration takes care of the needs of a growing nation. In recent years, the narrow lanes of the ancient city have given way to wide boulevards capable of accommodating the heavy city traffic. In spite of the many automobiles, the Trishaw remains a popular vehicle in the streets of Bangkok. In the streets and markets are a carefree and contented looking people. These small merchants, their families and customers live modestly, but free from want. Many of the city dwellers are of Chinese origin the Chinese immigrants play an important role in the country's economy. Buddhist temples mark the city skyline. Bangkok is the center of Southeast Asian Buddhism. 
Alongside an ancient temple rises this modern statue of Buddha, the founder of their religion. It is known as the Great Standing Buddha. Temples and pagodas with their ornate spires reaching skyward can be seen in many parts of Thailand. Ever since Buddha's disciples carried his teachings to Southeast Asia, the best craftsmen have used the most precious materials in the construction of these places of worship. Legendary figures like these giant demons glitter with colored tile and precious stones. The demons are supposed to guard the temple from evil spirits. In Buddhist Thailand, all men are supposed to spend a part of their life as monks. Monks can be seen commonly. Dressed in saffron robes, they carry a begging bowl or sack in hand wherever they go. Monks are allowed no possessions and must beg all their food from people who consider it a privilege to give it to them. Bangkok is built on the delta of the Chao Praya. Canals called Klongs spread throughout the city. They are used not only as a convenient means of transportation, but serve as shopping lanes as well. Merchants sell all manner of goods from their small boats, and some of the Klongs become actual floating markets. The entire family helps operate the business, and the days are spent along the many miles of Klongs. The Klongs lead into the main stream of the river where larger boats serve to transport most of the goods that are moved in Thailand. Whole families live on these boats, traveling up and down the river, serving them as business place, as home, and for recreation. Roads up country from Bangkok have been slow in developing, and so the rivers are the main highways. Along the banks, the larger villages are located. Since the river rises rapidly during the rainy season, the houses are built on tall poles. During the rainy season between March and October, the river will rise several feet and overflow its banks, but the lively river traffic never stops. Many of the people who live in these villages are engaged in river commerce, trading with those who grow food for the city's markets and with those who bring to the villages products of the surrounding forest. But the majority of Thai people live in small farm communities along Klongs which carry the river water to their rice fields. The paddy fields stretch as far as the eye can see. Rice is not only the main food for all of the people, but much of Thailand's economy is based on its abundant rice crop. Unlike other areas of Asia, the plains of Thailand yield more rice than the people can eat. Rice can be grown only where there is a rich supply of water. And because so much land in Thailand is flooded part of the year, rice is the only crop that can be raised efficiently. In some places, and in some seasons, water must be pumped into the fields from the Klongs. Many farm families have water wheels with which to do this. Some are power operated like this one, others are run by hand. Water from the rains and irrigation from the swollen rivers supply the fields with the water which the rice plants need for growth. The Santikinok family are rice farmers who, like most of the people of Thailand, like to take some time off from farm chores while the rice is growing. They visit their neighbors and relatives along the Klong, which flows by their home. Samang and Bun Chu, the mother and father, and Shalam, their son, live on the same farm their family has owned for many generations. They love their land and would not like to leave it for any other job. Here, they have all that they need and life is comparatively good. 
Their home is built at the edge of the rice paddy. Bunchu has saved some of the money from his rice crop to buy good teak wood to build this new house for his family. Teak is a hard and strong wood which does not rot in water. At the boat landing, the two Santikanok girls, Tonyo and Tonyen, are waiting to hear the news from neighbors and relatives. They stayed home to watch the house and to take care of the chores. Each member of the family has his own job to do. Bunchu made the plow which he carries on his shoulders. It is not unlike the plow his ancestors used generations ago. It is so made that it will cut a deep furrow even underwater. Bunchu is proud of his strong water buffalo, without whose help he could not farm so successfully. From the time he was very small, Chalam has taken care of the water buffaloes, making sure that they have plenty of time in water to protect them against the heat since they have no sweat glands. When the paddies are all plowed, it is time to plant the rice. Bunchu and his family plant rice seedlings by hand. The seedlings have been grown in a seed bed. Then the healthiest plants were selected to be carefully planted in the paddies, one by one, each about the same distance apart from the other. In this way, Bunchu makes sure that his rice will grow evenly and yield a uniform and good crop. Other farmers who do their planting by broadcasting the seeds on the water have less work, but their yield will not be as great. At mealtime, the family often eats on the ground outside their house, which has been covered with rice straw. Fish adds variety and necessary protein to the daily diet of rice. In Thailand, many people now use spoons and forks instead of the chopsticks or fingers. Bunchu and Chalam like to walk through the tall green rice as it grows, to feel the damp, rich earth under their feet, to make sure that all is well, for on these green fields their lives depend. After the rice has been planted, there is little to do until it is ready for harvesting some five months later. But from time to time, there is weeding to be done. Bunchu likes to keep his paddy tidy. Working with his son, Bunchu teaches Chalam to be a good farmer, as good as his father or better. After harvest, Bunchu will have several boatloads of rice for sale. Chalam can handle a boat nearly as well as his father. For all of his life, he has lived by the water and with boats. But it takes two men to pull the heavy load down the Klong to the main stream. Bunchu's reward for being a good farmer is a crop that will mean money to buy clothes and tools and even small luxuries. And for those countries who cannot produce all the rice they need, Bunchu's hard work will mean food. The elevator at the rice mill, whose camouflage coloring still remains from the last war, receives the surplus rice which Bunchu and the many farmers like him have sold to the rice merchants near their village. The merchants pack the rice in sacks, which are now unloaded and taken into the elevator. At the elevator, rice is graded and packed for export. Then it is conveyed to boats called lighters, which will carry it out to the big ships in the harbor. This rice will find its way to the markets of India, China, Japan, the West Indies, 
and other countries where it is needed. In return, Thailand will buy, with money earned from rice, the machines and materials it cannot produce efficiently at home. And so, the foundation of Thailand's present and future prosperity rests on farmers like Bun Chu, who provide the all-important rice so needed in the lands of Asia. Respectful of their own traditions and faithful to the ideas of their ancestors, the modern Thai are working hard to affirm and maintain their proud position as the oldest free nation of Southeast Asia. We are going to try, where am I? We're going to try the scanner again. Um, this is adaptation uh, in animals. Enjoy. The history of animal life on the Earth stretches back for hundreds of millions of years. And during that long period, many different kinds of animals have developed, with many variations in size and shape and patterns of behavior. Each kind of animal is suited for a specific way of life in a specific kind of place. These special characteristics are called adaptations. Nearly all animals are adapted for movement in certain ways. Some animals have adaptations that help them to move in water. The jellyfish is one of the simplest forms of animal life. It swims by using a layer of muscle tissue water out again in a kind of jet propulsion. Actually, a jellyfish is not really a fish at all. Real fish are much more complicated animals and a fish has several adaptations for swimming. The bodies of most fish are streamlined and the skin is covered by a slippery substance. This slippery covering lets water slide easily over the fish's body with very little friction. The large tail fin is used to push the fish through the water and the smaller fins are adapted for steering and maintaining balance. Other animals are adapted for movement on land, and most of these animals have legs. Each type of land animal has its own characteristic way of moving, because its legs are adapted for its own specific habitat and way of life. Some animals spend much of their time in the trees, and their body structure is adapted for climbing. The feet of an opossum are well suited for grasping the branches and twigs of a tree. And its tail is also useful in climbing. Some land animals are adapted for moving without legs. A snake has a long flexible backbone, which makes it possible for the snake to bend its body into curves. By pushing against the outside of each curve, 
the snake is able to move its body forward. So there are several adaptations that help different kinds of animals to move on land. And there are other adaptations that help some animals to move in the air. Most adult insects have wings, as well as legs, and their wings give them an important advantage. By flying, instead of moving on land, these insects can cover a much larger territory as they search for food. Birds have much more complicated bodies than insects, and the body of a bird has several adaptations for flying. A bird has a large breastbone that provides a place for the attachment of the powerful muscles that move the wings. Birds are the only animals with feathers, and feathers are a very efficient adaptation for flying. Feathers are very light in weight, but the wing feathers are still firm and strong, forming a broad surface that helps to push the bird through the air. These adaptations give nearly all birds the ability to fly, but birds are adapted for other kinds of movement as well. All birds have legs, and they can move around on land. And some birds, including geese, as well as ducks and swans, are also adapted for swimming. These birds have webbed feet, which they use as paddles. Webbed feet are also found on other kinds of swimming animals, like the beaver. Beavers are able to move easily both in the water and on land. So there are several different adaptations for different kinds of movement. But an animal must also be adapted in other ways to survive in its environment. Some animals have special adaptations for life in a particular climate region. In the hot, dry climate of the desert, a camel can live for several days without food or water. The hump stores food in the form of fat, and water is stored in several extensions of the stomach. Camels are now found only in the deserts of Africa and Asia, but several other animal species live in the deserts of North America. During the hottest part of the day, these animals usually stay underground, in the burrows they've dug to protect themselves from the heat. Most of them, like this pack rat, are small and can live on very little food. This kit fox has another adaptation that's typical of many desert animals. The large ears form a broad surface that gives off excess body heat into the air. Large eyes are also an advantage for a desert animal, like this ringtail, a relative of the raccoon. A ringtail can see very well at night. It rests underground during the day, and then at about sunset, it leaves its burrow. It searches for food at night, when the desert air and sand are cooler. In the temperate climate region, the approach of winter brings a major change in the environment and the animals living here have adaptations that help them to survive the change of seasons. Many birds escape from the cold temperatures by migrating to a warmer climate. The birds that remain grow additional feathers, and this covering of feathers provides very effective insulation against the cold. Mammals are insulated in winter by growing a heavier coat of fur. There are many other adaptations that help certain animals to stay alive in winter. At the bottom of a pond, a frog survives in a dormant or inactive state. Its heartbeat and other life processes have slowed to a minimum, and its body temperature has fallen almost to the freezing point. Many insects are not able to survive cold weather but they leave their eggs behind in a sheltered place. Under this small bump on a tree are insect eggs that will hatch when the weather becomes warmer. A cocoon provides shelter for another type of insect. Inside this cocoon, a caterpillar will change into an adult moth. Under the snow, 
a layer of soil protects an ant colony from freezing temperatures. It's warm enough here for the ants to stay active all winter. Gradually the days grow warmer and a new cycle of life begins. Many young animals, like these baby rabbits, are born in springtime when food becomes more plentiful. So many animals are adapted for the special conditions of a certain climate region. But wherever an animal lives, it must also be adapted for eating certain kinds of food. Animals are adapted for eating plant food. A cardinal uses its short, heavy beak for cracking hard seeds. And a hummingbird has a long, thin beak adapted for sucking nectar from the flower of a plant. A grasshopper has a complex set of mouth parts that can rapidly chew a leaf. Almost all mammals have teeth, and their teeth are adapted for eating certain kinds of food. Mammals with hoofs have flat teeth, used for grinding grass and leaves. Other animals are adapted for eating meat. Hawks and other birds of prey have sharp hooked beaks that are well adapted for tearing meat. The feet of these birds have sharp talons used to capture prey. There are many animals that feed on both plant and animal food. Bears are well adapted for capturing and eating other animals, but a bear will also eat grass, fruit, and other kinds of plant food. Animals that eat several different kinds of food can change their diets during the year, depending on which type of food is most plentiful. Large, powerful animals like the bear are in no danger of being captured and eaten by other animals. But for many animals, survival depends on adaptations that can protect them from predators. A porcupine has a body covering of sharp quills that can easily puncture the skin of an animal that attacks the porcupine. The color and pattern of an animal's markings can also provide protection. The coloring of a female bobolink closely matches the vegetation around her nest. That helps to protect the young as well as the mother. But the male bobolink is not camouflaged, and his coloring can help to draw attention away from the nest. There are some animals that change their color as the seasons change. In winter, a snowshoe rabbit matches the snow, but as winter comes to an end, this white fur will gradually be replaced with brown fur that matches the surroundings in summer. Another adaptation for protection is a rapid reproductive cycle. These newborn mice will become fully adult within six weeks. Mice and other rodents, including squirrels and chipmunks, are killed in large numbers by predators. But their large birth rate and rapid life cycle make it likely that some of them will survive to become parents. Some other animals also find safety in numbers. Hoofed animals of many species live in large herds, and they protect their young by keeping them in the center of the herd. And because hoofs are well adapted for running, the healthy members of the herd can usually escape from a predator. And so, these healthy animals will survive to become the parents of a new generation. That's important, not only for these animals, but for the meat-eating animals as well, because it helps to make sure that both kinds of animals will be able to find enough food. The meat-eating animals could not survive if they were to kill off all of the animals that they use for food. And if some of these animals were not killed and eaten, their total numbers would become too large for their food supply. So the adaptations of animals work together to help preserve the balance of nature. Each kind of animal life has certain advantages that help it to survive, because each kind is adapted for a specific way of life within a specific environment.
someone, uh, a couple of people were talking about Coronet and its history. So one of the things that happened to Coronet is that it got acquired by Simon & Schuster. So you can see the logo here. This is the Simon & Schuster logo. And Coronet and MTI film combined, there was a lot of back and forth. And at one point, um, Coronet owned Centron, and then somebody at Centron bought back some of the films at Centron, but not all of them. Um, it, it's a mess. <laughs> it's a real mess. But MTI uh, was Motorola Telecommunications, uh, and it's a lot of police training films, a lot of uh, films about crime and safety. Um, so we're, as part of this Coronet collection, we're finding all this stuff, all this amazing stuff, and we're trying to share uh, as much of it as we can online with you. Uh, and some of it is interesting and some of it is not interesting. Um, so that air pollution one was dry, uh, federal government uh, talking to scientists about uh, air pollution. It wasn't talking to the average person that would not have been shown on television or in a classroom unless you were environmental scientists. Uh, thanks for tuning in today. Very much appreciate your eyeballs. Uh, you can show your support for AV Geeks by hitting the thumbs up or the like button or ringing the notification bell. Uh, you can also watch other videos that we have on our YouTube channel. Uh, those have ads on them and the ads actually help pay some of the bills. You can also hit the super thanks button. Uh, some people have been doing that, uh, like watching the shows later and doing that. And so thank you so much uh, for doing that. I don't have a name, but hey, thanks. Um, you can also buy us coffee at ko-fi.com slash avgeeks or patreon.com slash avgeeks. But at the very least, um, watch our show tomorrow. That's a great way to support us. Also, we are going to be doing a series of live shows in February uh, in the Raleigh-Durham area in Durham uh, on uh, this Saturday. We're going to be, I think it's the 11th, we're going to be showing... Uh, a bunch of films called Awkward Film Awkward Love Makes the World Go Round, and it's films about awkward love, uh, just in time for Valentine's Day. And then we're going to do that show at the Alamo Draft House in Raleigh on uh, Valentine's evening. Uh, there's more information at, on the AV Geeks uh, site on uh, Facebook. And I think we're doing a show at the museum towards the end of the month, so about pollinators. So there are opportunities to see us live in person and not through a little tiny rectangle. Um, thanks again for tuning in, everybody. It's great seeing some new uh, faces on the comments list, even if you're uh, potentially Russian bots. We don't know. But um, yeah, even the Russian bots, please rewind and love each other. Um, and uh, we will see you tomorrow. Everybody take care.